Governor Gramlich is going to speak for about 30 minutes and will take questions for about 30 minutes. Uh, because of the nature of uh, interest in his remarks in the financial markets, uh, there may be questions that he will not feel comfortable asking, or answering rather. And uh, uh, so particularly if you are a student and ask a, a, a question that he doesn't want to answer, don't feel that he is being rude. And I'm sure that the press that's here uh, will understand as well. Uh, Edward M. Gramlich began his service as a member of the Board of Governors of the Federal Reserve System in 1997 and is serving a term which will expire, as I understand it, in January of 2008. He received his bachelor's degree from Williams College and ultimately a master's and then a PhD in economics in 1965 from Yale University. He began his professional career in the research division of the Federal Reserve Board beginning in 1965, serving as director of the Policy Research Division of the Office of Economic Opportunity from 1971 to 1973, when he became a senior fellow at the Brookings Institute. In 1986 and 1987, Dr. Gramlich was both deputy and acting director of the Congressional Budget Office. From 1994 to 1996, he served as chair of the Quadrennial Advisory Council on Social Security. Uh, during this time in government service, he was also a professor of economics and public policy at the University of Michigan, serving as chair of the economics department, director of the Institute of Public Policy Studies, and dean of the School of Public Policy at that distinguished university. Dr. Gramlick has a strong research record, publishing textbooks and articles in a number of topics, including benefit cost analysis, macroeconomics, budget policy, income redistribution, fiscal federalism, social security, and the economics of professional sports. A particular note, given our proximity to the National Baseball Hall of Fame, was his service as staff director for the Economic Studies Commission at Major League Baseball in 1992, following which I recall his name was mentioned as a potential commission. Although I have not seen Dr. Gramlich for many years, we share common roots <coughs> as two of the most distinguished graduates in history of Pittsburgh High School <laughs> in, what, in what was then rural and now is suburban Rochester. We have uh, participated together in the manufacture of maple syrup, <laughs> have played father and son golf. I was better than Ned. His father, Red, was better than my father. And perhaps uh, most significantly, I can offer testimony to Dr. Gramlich's selection uh, as bat boy for the Rochester Red Wings one summer in the mid-1950s. I am pleased to welcome Edward M. Ned Gramlich and his wife Ruth to Hartwood College, Dr. Gramlich. Thank you very much, Dick. I, I know Ms. Dick. I, I know you, he's got a, a, a more lustrous title for you, but uh, to me, he's Dick. Uh, thank you. Uh, I'm, I'm uh, uh, very pleased to be at Hartwick and uh, talk to you about an issue that we initially described uh, we, when we talked about this. We initially thought it would be election economics. And I guess the idea was uh, Bush is going to want to do this, and Kerry's going to want to do this, and the pros and cons, and that kind of thing. Well, the election is over now, and uh, it, it seems that that kind of a topic is a little dated. So what I'm going to do is to uh, switch gears a little bit and talk about two issues that I think are going to be very important in the next four years. One involves uh, the budget problem, and one involves Social Security. I'm at the Fed now, and uh, it, it's probably strange that I, I'm not going to be talking about monetary policy, but I actually don't think that will be so controversial. If, uh, if I were giving this talk 20 years ago, at that time, we had double-digit rates of inflation in all of the developed countries in the world. We had uh, triple and sometimes four-digit rates of inflation in most uh, or many emerging market uh, economies. Uh, I was uh, teaching macro at Michigan in those days, and uh, inflation is all anybody wanted to talk about. 
One thing that uh, economists have long believed, uh, best uh, summarized by a statement by Milton Friedman, that uh, inflation is everywhere and always a monetary phenomenon. <coughs> That's the exact quote. Uh, that uh, if, if there is inflation, the, the problem is really one of central bank. And one of the uh, pieces of good news, not, not so often noted, but I think uh, uh, very definitely true, is that uh, over the past two decades, central banks have gotten their act together. And now, as you look around the world, uh, inflation rates in all the developed countries are one or two percent for technical reasons. I would argue that that is uh, virtually stable prices. Uh, even emerging market countries have gotten their inflation rates down to, uh, in some cases, five and six percent. Some, in some cases, countries do this by a formal inflation targeting regime. In other cases, such as the United States, we do it by a firm commitment to stable prices. You see that in every document the Fed ever puts out. This has become a very bipartisan uh, agreement that uh, Republican economists uh, feel this, Democratic economists feel this. And I really don't think uh, that is going to be, that, that issue is going to be that controversial for the next four years. I uh, could be jinxing the, the Fed and uh, the goal of stable prices and saying that. But, but as I look around uh, to the things that, uh, as an economist, I really worry about for the next few years, monetary policy is actually not one of those things. I think we, uh, we uh, know what we're doing. It's been successful. We'll keep doing it. And it's pretty bipartisan. There, there may be some new, uh, a new chairman of the Federal Reserve over the next four years. Uh, but I wouldn't expect any of that to change. The two issues that I do want to talk about, however, fiscal policy and social security, there, there are some big uh, changes or big, uh, big issues. Now, uh, let me start with fiscal policy. With monetary policy, uh, I think the trick, which I just, um, just mentioned, is that you have to have a central bank with a firm commitment, and we call it an anchor, on stable prices. And if you have that, then the central bank has uh, flexibility to deal with uh, what economists call shocks, demand shocks, let's say, uh, which uh, you would know as recessions or soft economies. That we can take rates down, we can uh, add to the supply of currency, as long as markets understand that in the end we're going to be focused with uh, laser precision on the goal of stable prices, then you actually have a little more freedom, I think, to deal with uh, recession, which is the other half of our menu. I think there's a similar thing that is true for fiscal policy. Uh, the way I would put it and what I would hope for is that in, in making fiscal policy, um, and, and by the way, the Fed does not make fiscal policy. Fiscal policy is important in uh, how the economy works out, but fiscal policy is made by the President and Congress. That in the making of fiscal policy, that there would be a firm commitment, and I would say an anchor on trying to get the budget balanced in the long run. Uh, if we have that anchor, then I think the fiscal authorities have freedom to run deficits when the economy is soft. My problem with uh, recent fiscal policy is not so much that there was a deficit, uh, because I think that's quite appropriate in, in a time when uh, the economy is soft. My problem was really that as you look ahead, it doesn't look like we're going to uh, approach uh, my personal goal of a balanced budget very quickly. Now, why is a balanced budget so important? Uh, I would, uh, the, the reason that I would give is uh, a concept that very few people know much about. You can uh, examine newspaper stories on the economy, 
uh, do a word search or anything like that. And this, this issue will uh, probably not crack the top 100 economic concepts. But, it, but it's, uh, it's uh, a way of measuring economic performance that I think is very important. And it's summarized in the national savings. It is the share of output that uh, our economy devotes to building up the future. Consumption is not national saving. Investment is national saving. So basically, it's the, the split between consumption and investment, though it gets a little more complicated than that in, in real life. If we run budget deficits, that is a direct uh, re reduction in the national saving. That is, the private sector is saving, and uh, the government sector is, in effect, the saving. The, the saving that you do privately is uh, not, not uh, getting rooted through the financial system to uh, corporate investment, where we can grow the country, uh, improve productivity, uh, raise living standards over time. It's getting rooted just to uh, buying treasury securities and, and uh, paying for the, uh, the, the debt. And so it is not forward-looking policy. Now, uh, we, uh, it has been often noted that private saving rates in the United States are low these days, and indeed they are very low. They're got, got in, getting down toward 1% uh, measured appropriately. Uh, that's a, uh, a historical low for uh, many, many uh, decades. Uh, the reason for that, I think we all understand, it's the uh, kind of the credit card society and all that goes along with that. People are, uh, are you know, people <coughs> don't even uh, build up so much equity in their, their homes anymore because of innovations in financial markets. They're able to convert that to uh, to, in effect, to uh, cash and to uh, and consume the proceeds. So, uh, so private saving rates are uh, driving toward historic lows. And uh, on top of that, we've got uh, budget deficits that have uh, recently opened up. And the combination means that national saving rates, this uh, economic indicator that, that I am uh, very fond of, have, are, are, are down toward 50-year uh, lows. And that means we're not, uh, we're not uh, providing for the future. The, uh, the political side of this, I think, is well known, that uh, people give lip service to uh, what is known as fiscal austerity, to correcting deficits and, and all, uh, all types of things like that. But, what you really need is specific measures. And uh, those specific measures involve either uh, raising taxes or cutting spending. I don't want to get into the political question of whether we ought to adjust the budget on the tax side or the uh, spending side. Uh, as far as I'm concerned, we ought to just do it. And I, I don't particularly care how. Um, but. Uh, but the, the politics of this have uh, gotten very difficult. That it is hard to talk about uh, uh, measures that involve tax increases. It's uh, equally hard to talk about measures that involve spending cuts. It's even hard to talk about tax reform, which used to be uh, a case where we would uh, try to uh, improve the efficiency of the tax system by raising some taxes and lowering others. It's easier, even hard to talk about that when you get to the whose taxes are, are going to uh, go up. So the, um, the, the political uh, debate, if you will, around budget uh, financing has gotten uh, much, it, it's much harder, I think, than it used to be to uh, make changes in the direction of uh, balancing the budget. Now that's now. Uh, in a few years, as we all know, the baby boom uh, cohort, very large population cohort, will begin to uh, retire. Right now, the uh, Social Security system that I'm going to talk about in a second is uh, adding to the surplus about $150 billion a year. That's soon going to be over, and uh, the Social Security contribution will no longer be 
positive and, and pretty soon it will be negative. And it's going to be much harder to deal with uh, fiscal issues. So we, um, we have a situation where national saving is already at a 50-year uh, low. Um, the, an important component of that, the budget deficit, it's, it's not at an all-time high. Um, but it, uh, what it's, uh, it, it is uh, risen at a very inopportune time, is really the, the precise way to say it. The politics of deficit reduction do not look uh, very pleasant for those of us who care about deficit reduction. And I think uh, we, and, and as we look ahead, we may have even worse problems. Now let's suppose that uh, national saving drops a certain amount. So what? Traditionally, the, the, uh, the way to reason that, and the way we uh, taught about this for years and years, is that you get a drop in investment. I, I won't go through all the uh, details that are very interesting to economists and very boring to everybody else on exactly how this happens. But it happens, and just take my word for it if you don't want to be want to, want to keep the uh, boredom level down. So uh, corporate investment would go down, and that would mean that we're devoting less resources to uh, providing growth for the future, to uh, raising standards of living in the future, raising standards of living for our kids. That actually hasn't happened. Uh, in the United States uh, recently uh, in our drop of national saving because of uh, so, sort of an interesting historical episode. The other thing that can happen is that uh, investment can stay up, saving goes down, and we borrow the difference internationally. And that is that is what's happened. We have borrowed the difference internationally in the form that you, you see described in the papers as the high current account deficit. Uh, the current account deficit, if you uh, manipulate a few economic variables, is, is nothing more than the amount of investment that we have not financed by our own saving, but we finance by foreign borrowing. Uh, countries have uh, borrowed abroad uh, many, uh, many, many uh, growing economies have borrowed in their investment phase. Uh, investors in other countries have uh, in invested in these uh, recipient countries, and that has led to investment and, uh, and growth. So there's nothing wrong with foreign borrowing per se, but there are two differences about the recent episode in America. One is that, by and large, this is happening uh, the, the, the borrowing has not gone along with a spur in investment. It's gone along with a drop in savings. So the proper interpretation is that we're really borrowing to finance uh, consumption. The second thing is that America's borrowing has uh, gone on a lot longer than uh, in other historical episodes. It's really gone on uh, in a pretty big way for about 15 years now, the, the foreign borrowing. Okay. Why, why is that? Uh, and there, uh, there, there are lots of articles being written about that, but uh, one of the interesting theories that I, I just present to you is uh, known as the codependency theory of international finance. What the codependency theory is, is that um, on, on America's side, we are allowed to overconsume, in the sense I've been talking about, um, other countries in the world, uh, in, in particular, I suppose, uh, Japan and China, uh, uh, they're, they're motivated not by traditional investors, but uh, not as traditional investors, but by trying to keep uh, a good price that is a low value of their own currency for their, uh, to subsidize or to su support their own exports. And so, in effect, what uh, the central banks of uh, many Asian countries, particularly Japan and China, have done is uh, they have uh, been printing money, buying treasury securities to, uh, to support the uh, dollar and uh, to weaken their own currency. Um, in, in the case of China, they're actually paying to the dollar, so they're trying to prevent the appreciation of their own currency. 
and, uh, and, and life goes on. So we're over consuming, they're, they're uh, buying up all the treasury securities, and uh, the, the situation uh, right now, who, who's got a problem with that? We are uh, under saving and we're, we're not uh, paying for our investment. Uh, we are able to borrow the difference and we've got lenders over there, the foreign central banks that are, that are willing to, uh, to keep buying. So I, I suppose as long as the situation goes on, there's no problem. The problem is that it seems like it might be unstable and there could be a lot of things. And uh, Dick mentioned earlier that, that I, I got to be a little careful when I talk about exactly what could happen. But there seem to be a lot of things that could happen that would uh, rock the apple cart here. So, so my, uh, my issue on that is it just seems a, a little bit risky. There, we're risking uh, international imbalances. And I would frankly vastly prefer to see us get to a regime that I would call co-independence, not co-dependency. And the co my co-independence regime would, would involve uh, America cutting its deficits. Uh, that by itself would reduce demand because, um, you know, either we're going to have to cut spending or have to raise taxes and uh, consumption spending would suffer. So the, uh, the authorities in the other countries, and uh, by this I include Europe and Asia, may even be something, uh, some, some job left in Fed, would stimulate demand. We try to bring world demand back to where it is, but we do it in a way that America doesn't have these large deficits in borrowing. Okay, so this, uh, this issue will be there for uh, Bush for the next four years, would have been there for Kerry for the next four years. Uh, exactly, I mean, I, I've got ideas on uh, how, how to uh, proceed specifically. I'm not going to give them. I think that uh, th this is an issue that uh, we all ought to keep our eye on. It may look to you like sort of financial talk of deficits and interest rates and all those kinds of things. But I actually think it is very important for the future of the country. And I'd like to see us get back to a regime where we are a high saving economy, or at least a normal saving economy. Let me switch now to Social Security. Uh, Stick mentioned, I uh, do have a little bit of history here. I chaired an advisory council in the 1990s on this issue. Uh, I, I say at the outset that uh, Medicare is uh, a worse problem than Social Security. I'm not going to talk about Medicare today because I don't really know much about the issue. Social Security I've uh, spent a lot of time with. Um, uh, Social Security is uh, kind of is viewed as kind of a stalking horse for Medicare. If we can figure out Social Security, then we might have a chance at uh, figuring out Medicare. But in many ways, Medicare is a harder problem. And the reason I'm not giving it any uh, ink today is I, I just don't know much about it. But I do know a little bit about Social Security, so let me uh, quickly go through it. Um, Social Security is what is known as a defined benefit pension plan. What that means, this is an important concept too, is that um, the, uh, you, the uh, worker, pay into a fund and that fund pays you retirement benefits on a schedule that they set um, by, by some kind of mechanism. The alternative to defined benefit is defined contribution. What a defined contribution pension plan is, you pay into a fund, the fund accumulates, you may make investment choices about the fund, and when you retire, what is in the fund is what you get. So there, uh, the advantage of uh, a defined benefit plan to, uh, to people is that uh, the, the benefit uh, levels are set. There is no uh, investment risk, so to speak. The disadvantage of defined benefit 
is that the benefits aren't necessarily pre-funded. That is, the agency that is paying for the benefits won't necessarily have accumulated the assets. Defined contribution, the disadvantage is there, there is a lot of investment risk to the individual. The advantage is the defined contribution is pre-funded. Okay, now, the, uh, a lot of corporations have had defined benefit plans in this country. But if you've been reading the paper, uh, the papers, if uh, as as the corporations get in trouble, and uh, it's the most recent uh, industry to get in trouble in a big way is airlines, that uh, what happens is that a lot of these defined benefit plans get closed down and turned over to the government, and uh, we, the uh, private sector is uh, in in a big time way gravitating over toward uh, defined contribution. In one sense, this may be safer because the defined contributions, as I mentioned, are automatically pre-funded. Whatever is in the account is, is what is there for uh, retirement. But in another sense, it, it adds a great deal of investment risk to people. Social Security is a government-defined uh, defined benefit pension plan. And uh, so in terms of what ought to be done by Social Security, there are, uh, there are problems with Social Security as time goes on. We do have to make changes. But I would argue pretty strongly that we should not uh, end it. Because I think uh, already people are going to be asked to take more and more investment risk. And I think it's important, personally, this is a personal view, I think it's important to have a backstop defined benefit uh, plan that people can count on, financed by the government, because the government still does have taxing authority, and so the, uh, the underfunding problem is, uh, can be dealt with. I do think that changes have to be made in Social Security. My favorite change, my favorite change is that we take the retirement age and uh, tie it to uh, life expectancy. So as life expectancy grows over time, the Social Security retirement age grows over time. And that way, uh, that, that's, uh, if we would uh, make that change alone, that would solve a lot of the long-run uh, financing issues for Social Security. That is a hard pill for politicians to swallow. Some hard pills are going to have to be swallowed here. Now, there's another approach, which is, uh, I, I, it goes under various names. Partial privatization is probably the most common name. But what is meant there is to convert some of the Social Security system to defined contribution. In other words, instead of having all of your payroll taxes uh, go to the Social Security Trust Fund, you, you would, in some form or other, be allowed to have investment choices about those funds, and uh, when you retire, you would get what's there, like any other defined contribution program. Um, the, uh, as I have just said, uh, I'm personally not uh, wild about such a plan because I think we're already uh, gravitating to defined contribution in a big way, and I'm not sure I would, would like to increase that gravitation. But the, uh, the administration is com committed to this, and they're probably going to uh, propose some approach. Now, if we have that, and here's, here's another issue that you're, you would uh, keep your eye on, there is a huge issue that uh, falls under the rubric of transition financing. Uh, it's, it's kind of a technical term, but what it means is that uh, when Social Security first started, it started in the 30s, and uh, we had a lot of aged poverty that had a lot of poverty of everybody at that time, but, but in particular among uh, retirees. And so uh, the Social Security system, the Congress at that time, uh, paid out benefits before people had paid in the, enough payroll taxes to finance those benefits. So Social Security got behind a generation 
and then you get into the 40s and 50s, and uh, people who had worked uh, partially in their career paying payroll taxes got, got full benefits, and uh, these benefits were paid for by the payroll taxes of the younger people then working. So all of my life, for example, I've been paying payroll taxes, and uh, what has actually happened to those taxes is they have gone into the system and paid for my, my father's retirement, not for my retirement. Uh, if we come along at any point and uh, say, okay, our kids get to uh, invest the uh, contributions on their own, well, that's great. But uh, you, you've got a generation, let, let's say the generation of people my age, who have paid into the payroll system all their life, but uh, for, uh, you, you know, all of a sudden the, uh, the generation behind them uh, is not going to pay uh, as much for their retirement. So there is a big transition financing issue. Now, anybody who is uh, proposing reform of Social Security would uh, not leave people in my generation in the lurch. They would propose some sort of transition finance. What that means in a word is that uh, there would be uh, extra borrowing to pay the benefits of the generation that would otherwise uh, suffer reduced benefits. Nothing wrong with that from the, the standpoint of Social Security. Many other countries, by the way, have done this successfully. The problem that I see is that for America at this time, with already these budget issues that I just talked about, that is loading a huge burden on the budget issues. It, it, it really does amount to something like two trillion, which is something like uh, one fifth of our total output. So this is this is not small potatoes. This is big stuff. And um, so on Social Security reform, I think the questions that uh, I would encourage you to keep your eye on are, one, uh, how are we going to manage the transition? But two, uh, is it a transition we want to make? Uh, do, we, do we actually want to go there? I would, um, my, my own answer would, is I'm not sure I'd want to go there. I'd rather do something that, that I will describe as mending Social Security, not, uh, not converting it. But, uh, but that is going to be um, a big issue. On, on that one, I'm, uh, I, I guess, free to take a position because I've already had a very public position on the uh, Social Security Council. So if the uh, press reports that, that I have qualms about uh, partial privatization, that's accurate and it's also well known. So I will uh, quit there. These um, uh, politically, I think, uh, as we all have read, there is a, a unique opportunity for the Bush administration. Uh, I can't uh, remember since I think uh, maybe 1964 a time when uh, the president has uh, controlled both uh, houses of Congress. Uh, it will have. Um, um, you know, already a uh, majority of Supreme Court, could be even uh, more than that. So politically, uh, the, uh, the, the way looks uh, pretty clear for the Bush administration. Economically, on the other hand, I think there are a couple of very significant issues. I think this uh, deficit national saving issue is, is going to be very difficult. It would have been for uh, president of either party. That, that is going to be a uh, very difficult question. Social Security will, too. Uh, even, even if somebody uh, wants to preserve the present system, uh, I, it, it is incumbent on them, I think, to come up with, with some changes to uh, make it actuarially uh, sound over the long run, which it, it uh, present uh, is not. So even if, uh, even if we are preserving the system, uh, there, there would be big issues. But there, there will be especially big issues if we try to convert to some, some other kind of system. Uh, other countries have done this. I, I don't mean to say it's impossible, but the, the money is huge. And uh, the, um, the, the likely way of doing it, the way that other countries have used, will, will greatly aggregate aggravate the first problem, 
the budget deficit problem. So I think uh, for the next four years, there are some uh, very uh, serious economic issues. Thank you very much. I, um, uh, the, the lighting is such that I, uh, if, if you raise hands, uh, I might not see them, so they'll be pretty visible, we'll wave around, we'll, yeah, and, and speak up I, so I can hear. The deficit uh, that you mentioned, of course, is a terrible thing as far as we're concerned, but I understand that 40% of the That's codependency. The, the central banks in uh, largely Japan and China are buying treasury bills. That, that's what codependency is all about. What happens if they decide that they want their money out and drop a lot of it? That's, uh, that's exactly what I was talking about. Codependency is great as long as it goes, but if it falls apart, then we're in a pretty uh, difficult, awkward situation unless we get our own house in order and we get our own house in order. The, the easiest way to get our own house in order is to start balancing the budget and get our fiscal policy in order. But that, that's, a, that's exactly the point I was trying to make. Yes? Uh, the New York Times had an editorial on how to fix Social Security back in October. Well, I, um, I read a lot of editorial, so if you've got a particular point, why don't you raise well, it and let me comment. They, they listed six items. One of them was to link life expectancy to, uh, to income levels, as, as you suggested. Uh, one was to, to cut benefits slightly. The other was to increase taxes slightly. And then to include state and local workers. And they, each of these items, they actually noted how much each one would close the gap, 30% for this and right. 10% right. for that. And they came to essentially 100%. Right. Do you think that would work? <laughs> uh, I do think it would work. I, uh, the, the, uh, I had a, a plan uh, of my own in the uh, advisory council that I chaired. It, it included uh, three of those things. It, it actually did not include a tax increase. I, I thought it would be uh, 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 politically important to try to show that you could have some very sensible social security uh, reduction plan that you could do without a tax increase. So I. Uh, the the uh, particular plan that I advocated uh, is, is very much like the one that um, you, you report from the Times. Um, there are, we, we could fine tune these, uh, but th there are no shortage of uh, measures that, that would bring the uh, system into balance. We could think up a set of measures to bring the system into balance. What is the hard part? about Social Security reform is not, can you invent a plan? Can the New York Times invent a plan? Can somebody else invent a plan? We can invent plans. The hard part is the politics of uh, getting people to accept a rising retirement age, of getting people to accept, you know, let's say at the high, high level, a cut in their benefits. If you want to, uh, uh, go the tax route of getting people to accept a tax increase. Even the state and local part is hard because uh, through a, a weird uh, technical thing, state and local employees benefit from being out of the system and they, uh, the, it's the feeling of just about everybody on the left or right that they ought to be part of the same system everybody else is. And it's hard to, uh, to get them included too. They have their own lobbies. So, uh, the, the hard part is not the imagination, the hard part is the politics. Yeah? Um, how do you feel about the strength of the economy as the fourth quarter? Uh, that, that 
sounds like a current events question. I'm going to stay away from that. Sorry. Yeah. You mentioned um, that we're not looking into standards of living for the future as much as we have in the past, um, things like that. But looking at, say, sustainability and the fact that you know maybe the Earth can't support our current standard of living, um, is it maybe wise that we're not interested in expanding our standard of living for the future as far as like economic sustainability? Th this is a. Uh debate that, that I've had with my daughter, uh, <laughs> probably, uh, we're, we're probably uh, on uh, four digits, uh, the number of times we've debated this issue. Um, I, I believe that, uh, I mean, I, I'm an environmentalist, and I believe that uh, there, there are, are certain ways in which, uh, as, as we have economic growth, we are uh, hurting the environment. I would consider those basically a problem of the, the particular microeconomics, the tax and environmental policies. If, um, let's say, uh, uh, more, more carbon in the atmosphere is a problem. Let's put measures in to stop that. If uh, the ozone hole is a problem, let's put measures in to stop that. Uh, if you try to stop it by, by stopping overall economic growth, that, that makes everybody much worse off. And it doesn't really, it is not a pointed remedy. So I think the environmental issue is a very important issue. I'm, I'm right with you on that, um, but but I would like to get the appropriate strictures in place, and then have uh, uh, economic growth proceed at desirable rates. And I think that way we can have our cake and eat it too, frankly. Yes. Lots of uh, the people who defend partial privatization, or, or more than that, uh, do so pretty much from an ideological perspective that says we want to keep government out of this, you should have more control of your own money, et cetera. And that's always seemed odd to me since even partial privatization plans are compulsory savings programs where the government is basically telling you what to do with your money and you get to make micro choices about it. And I'm wondering if you could say something about how you think we ought to think about what Social Security should be for us as a country. How Should it be a way to enact a sort of libertarian view or should it be something else? What, what ought it to be for us? Well, I think uh, it's a good question. I think that um, Social Security was passed for a reason, that uh, we found that when uh, we, we got into economic uh, dire circumstances, a lot of old people did not have provision for their retirement. Um, part of that is uh, that you know, the economy goes up and down. This was the Great Depression. Part of this is uh, some of the involves some of the issue I was talking about in, in a different guise that uh, left to their own devices, I frankly am suspicious that every one of you out there would save enough for retirement. I, I just don't, uh, number one, I don't think you could do the right computation. You, you have no, well, many of you would have no idea of how to deal with the risk that you might live to be 100 and to provide adequately for that. And uh, we just found that, that private saving didn't do the job. And so we passed Social Security for, the, for a reason. So I think the uh, implicit social protection of Social Security and, and just uh, 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 protecting people against low incomes in retirement, against living very long lives, uh, against disability, there is a whole disability program in, in Social Security. How are disabled workers going to save for themselves? Uh, against inflation, Social Security is uh, perfectly indexed. That there are a lot of very important protections with uh, Social Security that we've had for 60 years and we take for granted. And uh, so I, I probably should have started with that, but I think that uh, be, before we, we start messing with Social Security. The first step we ought to do is salute it because it has put a lot of economic problems off the table. 
Um, so, uh, so I would uh, not be for uh, reducing any of that. I think uh, if if we did, uh, you know, in, in five years we'd be thinking about uh, reinstating it. Um, and also, then uh, you, you know, you you get to more modern debates. And um, given given the fact that uh, I, I think that the private uh, defined benefit pensions are. Um, they, they're uh, dwindling, you know, they're, they're just not going to be so prevalent that uh, we really want to think about how much investment risk we give people. I'm, I'm all for uh, having a, a base of Social Security and then letting people have 401ks and uh, programs like that and doing what they can. I, I have no problem with that. I think it's good. It teaches people to save and how to invest. All of those things are good. But I don't want somebody's whole retirement uh, living depending on that. I, I just think that is too risky as a society. Now, I've given you some personal views there. I, uh, I, I'm, I'm not going to pretend that this is nonpartisan. But, but on some of these, I, I've uh, worked on the issue a long time. And, and frankly, I have views. And so you just heard one. <laughs> yeah. If you only had one dollar, how would you spend it? Uh, but, okay. Well, where are you going with this? <laughs> Any way you want. You want to divide it up, you want to spend it on one thing. You personally, if you only had one dollar, how would you spend it? Uh, <laughs> well, I would, I would personally uh, spend it on baseball tickets. But I, I'm not sure what that's got to do with it. Thank you. You can get to see an inning. Ha half an inning, yeah. Uh, can, you, can you talk a little bit more about the trade deficit? Um, you seem to be suggesting that uh, the Chinese and the Japanese buy U.S. securities in order to keep selling their products in this country. And I guess I'm wondering, is there what would cause them to change do they, is that, do they have to do that, or do there, are there other possibilities? Or what might cause them to stop buying our securities? And also, kind of, then if that did happen, what, kind of what, what sort of would happen here domestically, and sort of consequentially from that? You're, uh, you're unfortunately asking a question that is, on the one hand, very interesting, and on the other hand, very dangerous for me, given uh, if uh, Federal Reserve uh, uh, people start talking about either the behavior of other central banks or uh, what uh, exchange rates are going to do and so forth. So um, let, me, let me just answer it in a, uh, a admittedly unsatisfactory way that uh, on the, there, uh, on the uh, central bank part, there could be a lot of motivations for the, the Japanese and the, the Chinese central banks. I, I mentioned them, by the way, because in, in the, the numbers that uh, have been given, they are the overwhelming holders of uh, treasury securities among foreign central banks. Other central banks are, are uh, engaging in this behavior, but to a lesser degree, uh, lesser importance quantitatively. So uh, there could be a lot of motives uh, that they have, and uh, they, they could um, they could change uh, their their motivation pretty quickly. It could be a new uh, politics or something like that. And then we're sitting there with uh, investment up here and saving down here, and we don't have the, the financing. So so I think that the risk I see is that investment would fall. For those of you who have had economics, um, you, you could uh, we could uh, have a lot of fun with curves and diagrams and so forth that uh, would, um, uh, which economic variable would fall and how fast and how much. Let me just say for these purposes, it would be some combination of income, relative prices, and exchange rates. There, there, there would be adjustments. And I'm sorry, I can't uh, take it any farther. Yeah. Uh, Chile started their social security system about 10 years before we did. Yes. And came a proper early 1980s, and their, their tax rate at that point was, I think, 27%. Yep. And they privatized. I wonder if you had any thoughts on the, the Chilean system. 
Chile is uh, probably the example that is, of privatization that is most successful around the world. Um, I know a little bit about it. Um, the, uh, the starting point, they had a, a government-defined benefit system that was a mess. They had different payroll rates and different benefit rates by industry. They had uh, very incomplete uh, participation. We have 98% participation. They had much lower. Uh, they had many people. They had a, a defined benefit plan in principle. Many people weren't on it. Uh, they had uh, uh, the, the administrative uh, structure was much worse than our present uh, Social Security system. Our system, by the way, is uh, fantastically efficient. Um, they, uh, they went to uh, privatization. Um, they had a transition problem, the one I spoke about. They paid for it by borrowing. Um, they they uh, somehow managed to get away with that borrowing. They still have some problems. They still have the problem that I mentioned with over-reliance on defined contribution, that they have so many people who uh, have not uh, done very well with their investments, and so they retire on uh, pretty uh, paltry income. Uh, it, it probably made, given, given that their defined benefit system was a mess, it probably made uh, more sense for Chile to switch than I think it makes for the United States to switch today. So that, that would be my summary view of that. But, but I will say that, uh, uh, you know, if, if I had uh, been there and known about uh, Social Security back in 1980 and I learned what Chile was uh, planning to do, they uh, came out of it in a much stronger position than I would have predicted that. I will admit that. But I still think that uh, I, I don't carry that lesson over to the United States, but uh, it is used as uh, the, the, the main uh, example of how privatization, partial privatization can work. They still, by the way, do have a small government uh, uh, system that backstops their, their private system, but it would be um, very small by our standards. Yeah? How do you respond to your daughter when you had your uh, discussions Um, I say that if you uh, followed me and uh, we, we uh, tied the retirement age to uh, life expectancy, we, we do have to take a, a little uh, nick out of the high income people and their social security benefits. If you uh, do that, uh, I, I think we can make social security uh, sound indefinitely. Uh, do you feel I, there's a political will, or do you think that's coming? Um, I, uh, all, all I'm saying is that it, is there a, a very sensible, reasonable way to reform Social Security? I think yes, there is. Uh, do we have the uh, political will to do it? Uh, it's, uh, it, it is a hard sell. Uh, I think it is possible. Uh, after an election to sit down and get uh, both parties represented to have a bipartisan um, uh, agreement. Look, we don't want to put our kids in this much risk, do we? I, I mean, come on, let's, let's get reasonable and come out with a plan. I think it's possible to do that. This country has done that before. Um, the, the recent history is uh, disappointing, yes. But, I, but uh, the, there, there are solutions there, and uh, all it takes is, is a will to negotiate and a little farsightedness. So I haven't uh, given up uh, as much as that, and I'm, I'm going to keep talking about this as, as I have talked a lot about it already. Yeah. I see a lack of concern and urgency with respect to the deficit, and part of what I attribute that to is almost a learning effect from the 1980s where we had these horrible budget deficits and national debt, and the mantra was always that we're going to grow out of them, and that they didn't prove to be particularly harmful, and then we corrected the problem in the 90s. And so from the political standpoint, there isn't necessarily the will to do anything about it. Do you see the pressures that are currently producing the 
Congressional Budget Office has been over this and over this, and the answer is no, we won't grow out of it. We're going to have to make some changes. Uh, differences between the 1980s, um, one is uh, that uh, nowadays uh, the, the codependency thing is a lot stronger than it was then. And so part of the issue is that, um, you know, the, the, the kinds of things, rising interest rates and, and all of that that you would normally expect just haven't happened. That's one difference. Uh, the second difference is that we're now a lot closer than we there were then to the, uh, the, the impending uh, baby boom retirement crunch. Both of these differences, I think, are dangerous. You know, on, on the one hand, we, we can get lulled to sleep by the fact that uh, we, we have uh, ready financing for a deficit. On the other hand, uh, every year, the, uh, the baby boom retirement gets closer and closer, and we get lulled to sleep by that. So I think it's, uh, in, in many ways, the, the deficits actually, as a share of the economy, are not as high as in the 80s. But I think, uh, in, in many ways, the situation is more dangerous than it was then. Yeah, there's a gentleman back there. Okay, yeah, yes. Yeah, yeah go ahead. Um, question with the uh, budget crisis moving as close as it is, and oil production reaching the performance closer and closer, quicker and quicker, um, we're going to have one fifth of our oil coming from unstable economies and repressive regimes. What are the economic benefits of coming off a petroleum-driven economy, and what are the shortcomings of doing that? The um <laughs> Yeah, I, I, it's 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 a good question. It's it's something to worry about. Uh, oil is uh, coming more and more from a, a very unstable part of the world. Um, th there are, like uh, Social Security, there are energy policies. Uh, most of them in this country have been supply-oriented policies. Um, the, uh, the notion of a demand-oriented policy that is actually uh, cutting back, you know, imposing taxes or whatever to cut back on consumption, um, that, that hasn't uh, entered the lexicon, the political lexicon. I think at, at some point it probably should. Um, energy consumption is price-sensitive. And so if there were uh, changes made in the uh, relative prices of, uh, of uh, consuming, you know, driving cars and so forth, they would work. So I think that, uh, you, you know, in, in a way it's frustrating, but there are solutions there. Uh, we, we just haven't adopted them. Two more questions. I see two hands. Okay. Um, It's uh, probably on the order of uh, 250 billion nowadays. The uh, interest on the debt, so that would be. I, I don't know how you want to measure that. That would be 20% uh, or so of total federal expenditures uh, provide for nothing more than interest. If uh, if we didn't have the interest bill, we, we would still have deficits, but it would be uh, much less. It, it's probably about 200 billion. So it's, it's getting to be a large number that we're paying in interest. I mean, the, the, the foreign central banks are holding these things, but we're sending money over uh, in the form of interest payments. They're not holding it for free. Yeah. Well, after every war that we're involved in, we always go in and um, get involved with rebuilding programs. You know, help economies rebuild themselves from the We're not paying Vietnam anything. Um, foreign aid in general is an incredibly small share of the budget. I mean, you, you know, there, it's 200, 250 billion for interest. If foreign aid is 10 billion, I, I would be amazed. I, I don't know exactly what the number is, but uh, the, the usual feeling among uh, people is the deficit comes about because of all this money we're paying foreign countries. It really is not true. 
uh, it's uh, the deficit would be, uh, you know, which is now uh, something 400, 500 billion. It would be uh, 490 billion without 400. So it, it, that really isn't the problem. The problem is actually in all of the programs that benefit us. And if we fix it, uh, it, it is we who have got to fix it and, and got to pay uh, pay for it, either on the tax side or the spending side. The president has a, one question by Brian. Uh, based on your great interest in professional sports, and particularly baseball, do you have any advice to the owners or the Players Association of Hockey? At the <laughs> uh, actually, I would. <laughs> uh, uh, showing how foolish I am. Um, the uh, the, the big problem in professional sports these days is the small market issue. You've got some, uh, as long as we have uh, New York represented in the country, uh, you're going to have some big market teams and some small market teams, and how do they uh, compete? Um, football and basketball have gone to a player salary cap where every team has the same salary budget. Uh, and. Uh, so they, they pretty much uh, compete on the arena or on the playing field on even terms. Baseball couldn't quite uh, get there, uh, but they did uh, uh, impose a compromise solution, which is a luxury tax where team, the, the high payroll teams such as the Yankees uh, have to pay into the kitty, and that money goes to the uh, lower payroll team. So that's at least a middle of the road step. Uh, the hockey strike is about the uh, salary cap, and uh, the, the players are dead set against it, and the owners want it. They might, uh, if they uh, kill hockey for too many years, they might sit down and say, well, maybe there's something in the middle we negotiated. That's exactly what happened in, in baseball. And, uh, you know, they... Um, before anybody loses too much more either income or uh, gate revenues, I would think they, they might want to take a look at that. So I, I, I frankly wouldn't have some advice. And <laughs> <laughs> what kind of guy is Pedro to be talking to Steinbrenner? I don't understand that. <laughs> uh, as, a, uh, as a St. Louis Cardinal fan of Pox <laughs> When uh, Rochester, uh, the Red Wings, when, when Ned was the bad boy for the Red Wings, uh, uh, it was a St. Louis franchise. And uh, it is a uh, symbol of your age when you start reading the obituaries of the New York Times and start reading the obituaries of guys that played uh, in those days, Rust area, and people like that. Uh, a gift from Harwood College, a value less than $20. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> there is a... Reception outside. Uh, Governor Gramlich will stay for a while. Please be kind and uh, uh, you bring luster uh, to us. Uh, highlight of our fall. And uh, thank you so much for coming.